<clears throat> main characteristics that uh, has made this uh, disease uh, different is that it transmits through uh, droplets. It's an infectious disease of the respiratory tract. Uh, it can also, on a smaller uh, proportion, transmit from surfaces touched by infected people and then by healthy people touching the same surfaces and then touching the nose or the mouth and then they, they get it into their system. Uh, but most importantly, through uh, direct contact with infected people. Uh, one of the circumstances that makes this such a different disease, and I say such different because Nobody that, that, that is alive remembers uh, a pandemic of these proportions or a disease of these proportions. Uh, others have been smaller in nature, uh, maybe more deadly, but uh, much more contained. Um, we um, now uh, have, and this is, a, this is a map from just five weeks ago, uh, we were at four million Dead, uh, uh, cases and, and about 280,000 deaths. And this is the map today where we have 9 million plus cases and close to half a million deaths worldwide. And as you see by the number of cases, uh, this is not near to stop. Uh, some places have managed differently, better. Some places can manage it poorly. Uh, some have plateaued in the high end of the curve, like the United States. Some are spiking still, like Brazil, a very big concern from uh, globally. Uh, some have gone down as many places in Europe. However, the world is still full of coronavirus and we're still having number of cases that increases day by day. In the United Arab uh, Emirates, we have had a total of 45,000 plus reported cases with fortunately, and this is one of the aspects that I want to underline and stress throughout my presentation, a great job on the healthcare providers and the institutions where these patients are early detected, early managed, early managed which uh, implies or has implied a very low uh, death rate for these patients. So uh, the rest of the presentation, I'm, I'm just going to give uh, three perspectives using, of course, uh, uh, the title of one very old cowboy's movie, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. And this is the good of the bad and the ugly of the COVID-19 in UAE. On the good side, and I am uh, a consumed uh, optimistic, is uh, no one can manage or do this alone. As I learned in my uh, CDC tenure, which spanned for a bit more than 10 years, all emergencies present with opportunities and secondary gain. This is not the clinical secondary gain, which is negative, but this is uh, really population-wide secondary gain, which is uh, positive. Uh, there are many books. I lived uh, in the days of the Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, and despite the tremendous disaster of Katrina in New Orleans, uh, the city was uh, rejuvenated by the disaster. So that was one of the secondary gains. Um, despite, of course, being a disaster causing an enormous amount of misery and death and illness. So uh, in this section, I'm going to focus on what has been positive during the pandemic in the UAE. It has, as uh, same that it has done globally, expanded collaboration and collaborative uh, work uh, as never seen before worldwide and locally. It has, makes us focus on the important and essential things in life and both professionally and personally. It has tested leadership everywhere. Uh, we enjoyed it, good leadership here, and that's why things have gone well. But we know that there are places, whole countries, that have not really had good leadership, and they are still in the middle of the pandemic, still having an enormous, intolerable, in an unacceptable amount of uh, sick people and deaf people 
uh, just because of lack or insufficient or inadequate leadership. This pandemic has tested our own discipline, tolerance, and adaptability to a new world. It has provided redirection of resources to things that are essential in the moments of urgency. It increased the research and innovation for startups and we were able to produce fantastic uh, projects in research that otherwise would have not been produced. It produced uh, an immediate acceptance and um, it was one of the big ahas of, of the pandemic of the value of virtual platforms and virtual interconnectivity between the world and amongst individuals. And of course, it made us bless the internet. I don't know if you have imagined what would this situation be without having internet. That was probably one of the last times that we had something of this magnitude. In the UAE, the Ministry of Health and Prevention acted quickly and enacted through a decree that the, the creation of the National Research Committee on COVID-19. Most, if not all, <clears throat> academic centers are represented in these four subcommittees, as well as the Ministry of Health, the Department of Health of the Emirates, and many other important players. The four subcommittees within the National Committee were the National Epidemiology Research Committee, which I chair, the Clinical Trials and Clinical Research Committee, the Diagnostics Committee, and the IRB Committee. And the charge to the overall uh, initiative and to each subcommittee was to review and approve potential projects in an expedited way, to promote and coordinate opportunities to transform local studies into national collaborative studies. We have many, as many places, studies that were local of lesser importance and they were by collaboration and transformation and ensuring access to data uh, promoted or um, uh, enhanced to national and multi-centric collaborative studies. It provided a hub for researchers to meet researchers uh, and, 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 and to meet systems and, and discuss difficulties and other challenges as well as accomplishments uh, so we could all learn in, an, in a real time. It provides technical assistance by collaboration and it decreased the time for feedback and approval of COVID-19 research by the national IRB. Overall in the UAE, uh, there were never shortages of food. We never run out of toilet paper, which is amazing to see that it did happen nationwide in several nations, in several countries in the world. Uh, there was constant and accurate communication and messaging provided by the government and institutions. There was warranty safety up to timely and uh, ever-changing standards. There was warranty of stock of PPE, a highly compliant population. There was serious and effective government with up-to-date information and very, very fast reaction and implementation of all measures that were evidence-based and that were known to be effective. That's why uh, since the beginning, the UAE is considered one of the top ranked safe countries uh, in the world uh, for the pandemic or throughout the pandemic. In the academic health center community, uh, there were, uh, there were um, big things that I think that made a positive uh, situation, a difficult situation positive, and those were the values and the respects of the leadership. There was support of institutions as profe and professionals, as opposed to in other places in the world, where sometimes even now, the healthcare providers became pariahs of the society and have been even threatened by the population and by institutions and by governments. Um, we value lived experiences by engaging with, listening to, and of course, partnering with academic health institutions and centers and with the public health sector and with the governmental institutions. So there was smooth uh, transition and communication throughout almost on a daily, if not much more frequent basis. Uh, it was important to get comfortable with the uncomfortability of the situation. We learned to work uh, a lot 
from a virtual window, which our computers became, and having difficult times and experiences that challenge our daily lives, our thinking, and stretching our approaches to the old life into this new world. We needed to become uh, bold and brave and courageous. So uh, in order to be able to lead some of these initiatives in an ever changing situation, changing almost on a daily basis. And we held ourselves and those around us accountable as we work. So we would become proactive, even being working uh, from home in circumstances that were uh, not easy to imagine just a few days of a few weeks or a few months back. As we, for instance, engage into teaching our students uh, that were everywhere in the world spread out, different time zones, sometimes more than 14, 15 hours away in the time zone, and still being successful in fulfilling the academic requirements of the semester and probably the whole year as it looks now. Uh, and just uh, to present one case study, which is the institution that I work for, Khalifa University, and its main partners for clinical practices and medicine and education, Saha, the Department of Health in Abu Dhabi, Damand, and Cleveland Clinic in Abu Dhabi. And you can see all the names that we were able to sit down and start working together quite fast assuring that this work would have relevance and would be developed in a timely fashion. We all know that the mortality rate is high for these diseases, especially in the peak years, in the elderly population. So uh, the question was how to make decisions in clinical settings, in academic centers, in a war-like condition without enough evidence, and it became an everyday or twice a day situation. Uh, with our group, we started thinking on, of course, the deterministic models for predicting epidemics and how these have been used to predict peaks nationwide, statewide, big populations and big scenarios. But the problem was the need within the academic centers to make everyday decisions such as how many people are we going to need tomorrow, given the progression of the disease. How many PPE are we going to need next week? How much interaction, how many beds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we use all models that you can see in the bottom that follow the same model, but uh, we ended up understanding quickly that the, the ability to predict an R0 that there was not the initial reduction number for the disease, but a timely dynamic format was a need. So uh, we um, started uh, by discussing and educating with clinicians and administrators that there are two common curves in, in, curves in, in pandemics. The first one is the total number of cases, as you see there. And the second one is the number of cases per day, as you see, which is the one that is uh, mostly referred in flattening the curve type is this type or style of curve. Um, we put together quickly a very a complex, uh, as simple as possible, but as complex as needed ma mathematical model to help clinicians forecast their everyday decisions through forecasting the, um, the pandemic and the number of cases that they would be receiving. It was preprinted in Merdrev uh, early in the, in the phenomenon now has been sent for publication. So what we did was that we took all of these uh, compartments of the clinical disease as we learned that they exist in our population as they presented into the academic health centers. And we stratified by age groups, as you see in the upper portion because age is very a very important determinant of the number of people that are going to become critical and hospitalized that were the most important needs to forecast in this model. And we will take into account the progression from each one of the clinical compartments as seen in the blue boxes 
uh, the time that it takes to transition those um, those compartments and the amount of people, the probability of becoming recovered and hopefully immune uh, for the disease. We manipulated all of these and calculated all of these numbers based on true numbers uh, taken from the progression of disease and data systems, which by the way, became one of the most important challenges that all academic centers here uh, uh, endured and is that most of the clinical data that becomes crucial for this type of modeling and this type of forecasting is compartmentalized, is siloed, and is not connected within the system. Even having uh, almost universal EMRs here in, in, here in the Emirates, the data was not easily accessible and it required a lot of human power and time to get it into an analyzable uh, way that would produce this type of, um, of, of, uh, of results. We modeled then the progression and the probability of progression for each one of these uh, parameters. And then we were able to start forecasting by using these models uh, to try to determine how many people we would have given interventions in these academic health centers and in the public sector. So we were in communication in our team with the public health sector that would forecast and feed the models and then we would be able to inform our academic health centers of uh, how many people would be coming to their uh, units or their institutions um, on an everyday basis and on a two, three, four, five, seven day projection so they would be get ready and prepared. Uh, we, we model uh, the impact of stratified population isolation, as you can see here. We also model the impact of extensive testing and quarantine. And I am going quickly through these curves, purposefully not explaining them to you because you have access to both the paper and uh, hopefully this presentation later. And I will show you the link where you can actually access the model and so you can model your own institutions at the end to forecast what we were able to forecast here. So another intervention, testing and quarantine. Uh, another intervention, the impact of the use of PPE and social distancing. And you can put all of these things in order to you see the curve in the right hand side of the screen, the number of critical cases that by age would be received in the institution. Uh, of course, the ultimate prediction is always how many ICU beds we will need, because we know that in this pandemic, the number of ICU beds available was directly correlated with the, uh, with the mortality or survival for by the disease. So the more ICU beds you would have, the less mortality in what we found in these models uh, to be a proportion of about eight avoided fatalities per extra ICU bed. So the directives and the administrators of hospitals were able to prepare uh, for clinical uh, management of these patients based on the forecasting, based on the ever changing, almost daily changing of the amount of interventions that were put out by the public health system. So what we learned is that clinical decision-making improvement uh, was better by the new knowledge gained by the disease as emerging and by the input of these into mathematic models. Then we were able to increase the confidence in those decisions as parameters got, got better and better and better and as the data system became more, became more timely and, and more updatable. Uh, the knowledge grew throughout a hands but challenged data system, but we have been working on improving such data systems since the beginning of the pandemic. It is unbelievable to learn how what you think is your uh, system, um, how, how when, when you have the belief that your system is really good and is challenged by a pandemic, uh, of this magnitude, it is unbelievable how much can you learn 
of how much can you further improve or need to improve your systems so they become really, really helpful in a timely fashion. Uh, we were able to actually model implementation in nodes for different UAE areas or cities, and we can apply copies of this model to uh, ever-changing number of groups or institutions or cities or countries uh, regardless. Uh, and of course, these strengthen the communication uh, between institutions from the public health sector, the government sector, and the clinical and academic uh, health sectors. Uh, and of course, uh, social isolation uh, became a very important mandate and um, these facilitated enormously the work by health workers. Uh, this is the site and uh, you will have access to the, to the um, URL uh, later as, as, we, uh, as we continue. And basically in the model, if you use it, you will see that there are two sets of parameters that you can play with to produce all of those curves that I show you one by one. One is the interventions that you have. So you just need to ask or get information on what are the interventions that are being implemented and at what level. And second, you can plot the number of cases in different uh, ICU, hospitalized, critical number of uh, fatalities that you will have. So we believe that this model, uh, we made it as simple as possible, but as complex as needed to make all of these decisions. So what was the bad? Well, the bad, uh, and I summarize it, is we can do it, uh, but we cannot give up. Uh, for, for, for now, for academic health centers, the main challenges have been uh, clinical rotations, for example. They, they have proven to be, especially when we foresee that this situation is not going to end soon. And if it ends, we're going to have resurgence uh, quite, probably quite often and probably quite uh, soon as well. Um, we, we need to start thinking on how are we going to educate our physicians. Uh, and, and the main problem forecast is that part of medical education from early on in their careers is going to be how to live with COVID-19 and how to practice medicine in the presence of a highly contagious, um, importantly uh, severe, serious disease. Migrating from face to face to distance delivery of curriculum uh, was everybody, uh, everybody's challenge worldwide. Uh, maintaining student engagement, keeping up with the quality of class teaching and learning, uh, loss of classroom interactions, limitations on assessment and difficulties on assessment, both clinical and practical, have been some of the challenges that we have uh, partially overcome. Uh, loss of clinical placements as we uh, do not use them uh, they evolve and the system evolves whether you're there or not. So it has been uh, uh, one of the issues. The disengagement of the clinical faculty that are not full-time faculty in some of the academic centers, especially those like ours that, that uh, uh, have a relationship with the hospitals, not a hospital uh, of the university, but a relationship with hospitals out in the community. Uh, one of them, concerning issues is that there is not a clear north on the distance. We're learning, we're adapting, we know that 2020 does not go anymore, and now we're talking uh, about extending uh, some of these uh, issues, limitations, and challenges all the way to 2021 and beyond. On the clinical challenges, and I, I didn't put here purposefully statistics or anything because each center has its own challenges. But, but I try to summarize what, uh, what people, CEOs, CMOs of these centers, uh, chairs of departments, leads on, on the administrator side uh, communicated to me in, in a very informal but nationwide poll. Uh, one of the issues has become keeping up to, to date on the, on the pandemic. 
uh, this evolves quite quickly. Uh, each place has uh, responded differently and that shaped uh, on a country by country basis, many times on a city by city basis, the, the pandemic. The forecasting each one of these places is different. It provides different curves, it provides different response, different needs and different challenges. Uh, learning while running was one of the most challenging, uh, challenging things. And, and, and while running also means uh, while having to care uh, for a very, 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 very seriously ill uh, population in an unimaginable and unmanageable uh, amount and, and, uh, and, and with high prevalence. Uh, producing information and knowledge where we were running became another challenge. Testing the system and the delivery of care uh, while splitting some of these hospitals, completely changing the distribution of populations, making hospitals non-COVID and hospitals just almost exclusively COVID disease uh, specific, but also some hospitals that could not be split, splitting them uh, within uh, to, uh, to, to be able to receive COVID and not COVID patients. Uh, whilst all of this was happening, keeping the healthcare workers safe uh, became a very, very challenging. Unfortunately, then on the number of situations, unfortunate situations that we have had here with healthcare workers uh, has been minimal. Uh, managing shortages of supplies, especially PPE, but more, mostly also uh, not only PPE, but patient care needed supplies. Uh, especially for those that, uh, that needed to come in, in a, a much greater amount than usual uh, became a quite uh, important administrative challenge. Uh, overall prediction of peaks and adjusting preparedness, um, dealing with the shortage of health uh, professionals throughout and basically uh, managing a situation that either locally, institutionally, or nationally uh, could or overwhelm the system, could overwhelm or overwhelm. And now for the last stretch, uh, what I think is the ugly, and the ugly uh, aside from every uh, really chilling experiences that our clinicians have suffered in the front line and our academicians and teachers and learners have suffered in the in the front line on an everyday basis is the notion today that we started thinking that this was going to be just stay home two weeks and it will pass um, all the way to don't worry in april it will pass and uh, now is no worries the summer and it will pass but really in reality the main question is how long will this last and that is the ugliest part of this pandemic and this disease so we started by managing this situation simply be safe be sensitive be patient be informed be prudent be nice be productive this is going to fade away well guess what no it will not fade away uh, it might go down, it will probably go up again. As soon as you relax because of economic reasons, all of these measures that have proven to be effective and in the absence of a vaccine or even treatment to not, not only to treat but to prevent the disease, uh, we will be in this same boat for quite a long time. Uh, one of the big aha moments was uh, the very popular flatten the curve uh, became actually part of the bat and it became part of the bat not because we were able to do what we intended to do, which is take care of not overwhelming the, the health system uh, that would have produced far more deaths than those that we have had throughout. But basically, that by uh, flattening the curve, we have made the problem last longer. And now we have the feeling that it is not longer, but much, much longer. So some places that are going back and forth between releasing some of these measures, trying to open economies, et cetera, are seeing and reporting already the resurgence of, of cases 
and uh, the, 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 the occurrence of new peaks uh, or increased numbers like the United States that has had a unique behavior in the world with a plateau that has plateaued in the very high end of the disease, uh, not only in the number of cases, but in the number of deaths. So basically, um, we need to start thinking on our future, and this is not a, an unknown phenomenon. If you follow this curve, uh, we are just starting this phenomenon, and we are in what is called the honeymoon of disasters, where everything looks heroic, uh, everything, is, there's a lot of activity, the efficiency and the effectiveness are just yet not, not, not quite there. We cannot even measure them. And many times the movement is so much that we become even uh, less effective. Uh, quickly, we are, we are really uh, ending the, uh, the honeymoon uh, phase and we're gonna start going down and we have seen it in many places to the extent that there are some whole countries that have decided that the pandemic is no more. That being in the peak of the number of cases and in the peak of the number of deaths, the pandemic is no more. What is worse is that even the countries deciding that the pandemic is no more, the community and the individuals have also decided that the pandemic is no more. So we are going to go down the slope of disillusionment and that is going to create further uh, number of increased cases, probably further number of deaths, and um, hopefully it will not produce a reaction such as that the system will end up collapsing after all of this effort during all of these months. Uh, we're looking forward to, of course, having a vaccine. We're looking forward to herd immunity. We're looking forward to uh, drugs, medications that will prevent people from, that get sick from getting severely sick or critically ill. Uh, but those are not just yet in the north, not at least in the near north. So we will have to keep doing it. And that is the ugly side of this pandemic is that when everybody is getting tired and everybody is abandoning on their heroic part of things, we, can, we, we need to still keep going and keep the fort strong because the health system is definitely the protagonic system in this pandemic. So just to end, a few conclusions, thoughts, and take home messages for academic health centers and communities and individuals. Uh, academic activities seriously were seriously challenged by the pandemic, especially those that have to do with the clinical activities. We need to start thinking on how to send our students to places with a situation similar to what we used to see uh, almost rarely and almost, uh, you know, uh, uh, occasionally of uh, meningococcal infections, for instance, where we would close a whole service, everybody would get into this high, but now we have it uh, very frequent uh, for whole hospitals or whole system or whole places. Uh, without vaccines or treatment, primary prevention is unfortunately or fortunately the only way to immediately move forward. And of course, the academic health centers have a protagonic place to be uh, together with the public health system. We are spearheading still the initiatives for primary prevention of the disease, of course, while taking care of those that become seriously ill, hospitalized, or critically ill, so they don't die. The UAE and its academic health centers have done better than most, uh, in most countries in the world. We, we, are, we are enjoying a situation where collaboration, supplies, um, uh, 
uh, not overwhelming numbers and uh, good practices have produced one of the smallest proportion of deaths or death rates uh, in the world globally. And we're still considered one of the countries that have done things well and we keep being among the top 20 countries in the, EU, uh, in the, in the world for, for management of the pandemic. Uh, the, the academic health centers uh, reacted in a quick, serious way, and, and they are maintaining such reaction without abandoning the care for other patients. And we are starting to see the impact of the COVID pandemic in the not COVID population. So because we are aware of that happening, uh, there are concrete and specific actions to address the non-COVID population, so they do not produce either morbidity or mortality uh, uh, that is not related to the pandemic. Academic and clinical centers excelled in the management of their patients. That's why we have had lesser numbers and lesser rates, as I was explaining. Testing, of course, helps, but testing positives helps much less than testing all. So, so the focus here on testing all of those that are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic has helped a lot. It has helped on the overall management of the population. And of course, it helps decrease the number of cases that make it to the hospital and to the clinical centers. Uh, when, when you decide as a country to test all, you must uh, embed this testing initiative as part of integrated protocols and rely on tests, of course, that have good analytical and clinical validity, meaning uh, good sensitivity. We know now of the many, many types of tests that were marketed in some countries that had very low sensitivities and ended up producing more damage than good for the systems. Common sense in the population needs to be part of the education during the pandemic and the academic health centers are leaders in and are on the front line of those initiatives. It's probably as important as government enforcement, especially in the long run. Everybody talks about countries like Sweden, everybody talks about countries like uh, Switzerland, everybody talks about other countries that did not um, enforce uh, a, a serious or a severe isolation of their populations. And they, uh, some countries mistakenly made it their example to not do what they were supposed to do. So uh, if you compare the, the, the level of cultural development, the level of cultural uh, customs in a place like Sweden or Japan, and you try to put that in places like, for instance, now Brazil, you will have a catastrophe. So not every country's experiences can be generalized to others. And academic health centers' experiences are the same. They are very unique, very institutional, uh, very personalized. They cannot be easily extrapolated. However, some of these points can be used to think out of the box if you have not gone there on how can this benefit or not your academic center. And of course, this has become an amazing opportunity for collaboration between academia, clinical care, and public health. So some take home messages to the community is that, of course, this is not a flu. This is a serious, new, potentially deadly condition. There are places that because they do not believe in such statement, they are still having and producing death rates that are way higher than they should be. This is a serious disease causing complex situations for systems, challenging systems worldwide, locally, nationally, institutionally, etc. cetera. Um, uh, it tested our reality. We learned that there were many things that we were doing that were not needed. And we learned that we needed to do many things that we were not doing. So I think that understanding what was superfluous, what did not need to be the way that it was, 
just as an example, working from home for many systems is going to become the norm and is not going to become the exception. Um, it tested our capacity for innovation and research in academic health centers. And it tested it in a fast and furious way. And many academic health centers responding, responded uh, putting everything up to, up to the measures. So, so we enjoyed, for instance, in our center, uh, support to do research and to really, really come up with good innovative techniques, uh, products, and uh, uh, knowledge that has really helped the situation. And that's in worse, academic and technological innovation came. So I leave you all with this thought, which is a quote from the virus, because this is my new world, yours will never be the same. I think that that is the reality that we are facing. I think that this is the reality that we will face from, uh, for a while, and probably the one that we will face forever. This world is different, and uh, many of our academic health centers have changed, and they will never be what they used to be just a few months ago. They will never be the same. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Acuna. That was excellent. We really appreciate your time and effort for the presentation. I'm going to go ahead and open the floor for a discussion. If you have a question, you can either insert it in the Q&A box, in the chat box, or you can raise your hand and I can unmute you. Uh, we have four questions already. Uh, the first one, we are in the 21st century. Despite all the scientific and uh, technologies advancement available, what is the main factor that's making COVID-19 uncontrollable? Well, this, this, the, the characteristic of the disease, that's, that's how I would respond uh, very generically. Uh, it's, a, it's a disease that is transmitted easily and that is transmitted by people that are not sick, that are not ill. So that has made the management of the disease quite difficult. Other forms of infectious disease are not transmitted by people that do not have symptoms. So whenever the person becomes ill and starts transmitting the disease or infecting others, they are easily and readily identifiable and they are isolated. We have not been able to do that. So a disease that is uh, highly contagious, that has uh, a, a very high ability to infect others, that is transmitted not by direct contact or vectors, but by just droplets in the air, by people that do not manifest the disease, is what has made this disease so difficult to manage. And on the other hand, the issue that it produces a death rate that is quite substantial. Uh, some people quote it 10 times more than the flu, some people say 20 times more than the flu. They are all probably right because the death rate will depend upon the place uh, where the outbreak or the pandemic is affecting. So if you go to one place and they have different health system support and organization, the death rate is going to be really, really high. If they go to others that are a bit more organized, uh, that have huge support and a lot of resources, of course, the death rate could be much lower. But it's a different disease, and it's a serious disease. Um, the second question is, I do agree that the UAE is managing the pandemic well in general. However, I would like to ask your opinion on the differing responses of individual Emirates in the country. The most striking parallel could be Abu Dhabi and Dubai. The former has been strict in trying to reach zero cases in the past month, while the latter has been steadily opening up. How do you think this will affect transmission rates in the country? Well, that is a, a difficult question to answer because it depends on many uh, different circumstances. It, it is, of course, and you have seen one of the effects, and is that Abu Dhabi has closed... Uh, the, the movement of their people uh, in and out the Emirates. So uh, it, it will produce some decisions by, uh, by the government, it will produce some decisions locally, 
uh, we, we just need to be prepared for then again, uh, learning to live with the virus. Uh, it's, it's very understandable that there are uh, balances and concerns between the number of people that become ill and the consequences and the overall uh, economic impact of having places locked down and shut down for long, long periods of time. So balancing that act is very difficult and each place needs to be analyzed and needs to decide independently. So even in other federated countries like the United States, you have seen in the news that there are places that have maintained lockdown and have maintained measures and their cases are going down and some other places are opening up and their cases are returning to going up and, and going in an upward rather than in a downward slope. So, so we will have to see what is the reaction. Uh, however, the reaction will need to be quick and fast in, if the number of cases start uh, going up again in those uh, Emirates that have uh, opened up their business. Uh, why is COVID-19 spread around the world? Uh, why does it spread by fluctuated percentages around the world? I do not understand the question well, so I am going to do my own interpretation. Mm -hmm. And basically the answer that I would give to the question, which is why it spreads differently in different places in the world, is what I mentioned throughout the... Um, throughout the, uh, the, the presentation. Let me give you uh, an example. Um, the, the Sweden has been a kind of a pilot natural experiment on, on, the, on managing COVID-19 because they didn't completely shut down. They promoted social isolation, distancing more than isolation, and, and they did fairly well compared with other places. If you compare them with their peers, which are their neighboring countries, they actually did worse. They had more deaths. That is very well known. Uh, but if you compare them with other countries far away or in Europe, they did better. Why? Because there are inherent cultural aspects that make that social isolation is easy to maintain and is easy to continue and the population is disciplined. So when you tell them you need to go out with a mask, they will go out with a mask. If you tell them do not get closer than two meters, they will not get closer than two meters. Well, they never were closer than two meters for starters. So that's why Japan has done uh, well as well without being extreme in the measures. But if you go to a place like Latin America, where everybody hugs and everybody parties and everybody dances, then just saying, I am going to do what Sweden did or what Switzerland did or what Japan did will not work. You will have a lot of cases. And of course, you will overwhelm your system and you will have a lot of deaths as they have. So my home country, Colombia, has been very strict on the measurements of isolation and social distancing and has done quite well in a region where many of the other countries are doing quite bad, starting by the United States. Within the United States, the different states have done differently because of the cultural aspects of the population, the discipline of the population, the resources, and of course, the government enforcing some of these measures if they need to be put in place and the population would not do them on their own. So it's a conjunction of factors that determines that each place will react differently and will produce its own dynamic for the same disease. In other simpler words, the disease is not the same everywhere even if it's produced by the same virus. Um, what is, in your opinion, the lessons learned from, COVID, from the COVID pandemic for the future public health workforce needs, training, and development? 
Well, if you would ask me to make a wish list and prioritize that list, I would say that the number one lesson to be learned and, um, and the number one field that could help us in a future outbreak that will come, not only by COVID-19, by different viruses, that has been the, the history and it will repeat, is to have data systems that are really modern, really useful, really organized, and that they produce very timely information. If we can detect earlier and all our data is integrated, we can learn faster, cheaper, and produce knowledge that will allow us to direct systems that act and do things both in public health and in clinical systems and guide them in a timely fashion so they can do the best possible interventions that they can. That is number one. Number two, you need to have systems in place uh, in, in order to react to what we know becomes the common denominator of these type of diseases. It was fortunately that this disease with the ability to spread that it had was not as bad as the other forms of SARS because then it would have been a complete, a complete disaster. It would, it would have been devastating. However, we might have that in the future. So if we react at the speed that we reacted for COVID-19 in the future with something that kills more people, we're gonna be in a really dire circumstance and we're not going to be able to, to produce any reaction whatsoever before many, many people would die. So I think that uh, within the public health system, having a really good integrated with the clinical system, data system that produce a lot of knowledge in very little time is one of the real benefits of, of uh, this pandemic. Uh, we hopefully will have that as a benefit. And then to try to produce, of course, vaccines and medications, that is a partnership between industry and public health. Um, what are the measures you are thinking to take in order to return back in all universities, academic centers, et cetera? Wow, that's a, that's a difficult one. Uh, but if we are going to have to live, I mean, as you can see it in the screen, uh, this is the virus talking. This is now COVID-19 world. It's no longer ours. So if, if medical students need to need to continue to be admitted at, at, at uh, academic institutions. Part of the early training and learning of those new medical students, not only medical students, this is applies for nurses and physical therapists, every clinician, regardless of the discipline, will need to learn how to practice safely in the middle of having this disease as uh, endemic disease, not, 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 not anymore as, an, uh, as a pandemic or an epidemic disease. So, so we need to learn how to teach uh, our clinicians how to live and be safe in such conditions. The management of all clinical entities had now a dichotomous a way of looking at it with the COVID-19 and without the COVID-19. We know that. We have seen it published. We, everybody's talking about that. So, so we need to learn how to live with this virus. Now, hopefully we will have a vaccine and then that would change the whole panorama. But if the immunity produced by the virus which we still do not know how good it is and how long will it last, is not as we expected, then we will have to learn how to live with it. Um, we're gonna take one more, one final question and all your, all your other questions are noted. I will forward them to Dr. Acuna and get back to you. So uh, how are you dealing to resume the economic life in UAE, it's spe uh, specifically to open the airport to allow passengers to fly? Well, um, there are protocols now 
that actually become a partnership between the health system and the industry, whether it is uh, airplanes, whether it is uh, cruises, whether it is. So uh, testing is going to become a very, very important and uh, there will be management of disease according to testing. For instance, right now there are protocols out by the Centers for Disease Control in which in general, in summary, uh, people need to be tested a few days before, then they need to be isolated, then they need to be tested again before they arrive, and then they need to be tested after arrival, and pending upon the, the results of those tests spanned over the 13 to 15 day time span of what we estimate is the maximum incubation period for the virus, uh, we would be able to tell each person, you need to remain isolated, you can go out, et cetera, et cetera. Even before the flight, you can fly, you cannot fly, et cetera. So the availability of better tests more rapid tests that give rapid on-site results and our increased knowledge of how to test better individuals that are asymptomatic is what is going to determine when can we open, at what level can we open, and how are we going to manage this opening. Okay, thank you everyone. You can forward your questions to international at ahcdc.org and I will forward them to Dr. Aquina and get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you Dr. Aquina for contributing to the effort and sharing your experience and observations in this timely event. It was a very nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for coordinating it and looking forward to the next one. Thank you. Thank you everyone.